Another Annie News, Eminence and Shadow video. We got Rose's betrayal of Shadow Garden and Sid's Einstein Vitality. Tell me what's up. We all know misunderstandings lie at the forefront of Eminence and Shadow, but yep. the one between Rose and Sid just keeps on giving at this point. Neither are even remotely close to being on the same page, yet somehow every encounter just strengthens their bond further. It's this hilarious dynamic that surprisingly makes Rose one of the most developed. <laughs> this is when he act fake like he died, and Orion is like, oh no! How are you actually dead? Well, no, this actually rizzed her up so much. Characters in the entire series. There wasn't much. This makes Rose one of the most well developed characters That's in the entire series. This makes Rose one of the most developed characters in the entire series. This is true. And I'm surprised how much, like, effort and investment the author has been putting into Rose. Compared to every other girl, I thought she'd be just like a side supporting character girl. And to an extent she is, but she is really important. She's part of this crucial arc. We're recapturing the Oriana Kingdom. She's one of the main girls that's been given power directly from Shadow. And she's like, I'm not sure if you can say that she's a main love interest, but she's definitely a love interest. Rose is actually super high up in, this, in the amount of girls that's been developed. Yeah, for sure, I agree. There wasn't much cut content with regards to him and her, but when it came to her mission and the subsequent fight with Victoria, quite a bit was left out from the actual conflict. Now, every time 559 shows up, and goddamn, look at Mother's Giat right here. Holy shit, mom. Her ass is making a heart shit. But every time 559 shows up, I'm like, should I refer to her as Victoria or 559? Because they haven't explicitly said Victoria yet. So if I say Victoria, will it be like a spoiler for the people watching my regular anime reaction content? It's like, ah, so I, that's why I stick to 559. It was a good bit of action between Victoria and the cult, then even some surprising moves from Sid a bit after. So, if you want to see what it is the anime left out from this in the novels, then stick around as I go through all of it. Very quickly before I get started though. Hashtag ad incoming, rate Shadow Legends. I just want to point out that I recently got these. Uh -oh. They're Eminence and Shadow cards from a Japanese card game Wait. That I'm opening on stream soon. I usually open Weiss Schwartz anime cards. There's gotcha! Eminence and Shadow gotcha cards? But since both have signed versions from the voice actors of my favorite characters, Overlord Mushoku Tensei? And do them instead. What the fuck? Wait, I'm actually interested in this. If you're wondering where I got them from, yeah. there's a great site called Mecha Japan that ships them straight to me. Yo, this is Whether an actual W ad. Anime cards, giant. I think this is ReZero. Plushies or video games, MechaJapan.com will ship them Yo! They're a global storefront that specializes in authentic otaku I'm goods. I'm actually kind of interested in this. Which are some yo, yo, look at the plushies! Look at the plushies! Straight from Japan. All of <laughs> look, look at the Oriana plushie. Wait, 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 wait. This is an sorry, 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 sorry. Straight from Japan. <laughs> Oriana? Oriana Alexia plushie here looks actually pretty good. Watch. They look pretty good. And then, watch, watch. All of, all of which... What the fuck happened to Beta? <laughs> and, uh, why does Beta look so goofy here? Which <laughs> are some of the most reasonable prices I've seen anywhere. Okay. So, if you want to get... Damn! Look at this alpha figurine, dude. The Delta card sleeves are already sold out. If you these yourself, then feel free to use my link in the description. Actually, would that... that I hope to work some more with in the okay. future. This one actually okay. looks interesting. Okay. Episodes 29 and 30. The Key and the Caged Bird. Mm. Covering chapters 1 to 2 of volume 4 of the light novel. Why is she on the front cover? Who's? That's Nishina. That's Nishino? Nishina? Nishino? I, well, we know that she might come back into the future, but if you're gonna put her in the front cover... The episode mm, does start off with mm, Rose having her nightmare, but it's neither in the cafe that Marie owns, nor is it at the same location that Shadow is at. Where Rose awakens from this nightmare is... I feel so bad here, because sometimes, you, you know, I'm trying to make content and trying to make it entertaining for you guys. So whenever I see something on screen that, you know, could be funny, I like to say it out loud. As soon as they show me the Oriana panties here, I said, mm, she's wearing white panties. And then suddenly she starts sobbing as she's crying because she's having this trauma. And she's having nightmares of the haunting scene of her killing her dad. I'm like, God fucking damn it, that was the worst possible timing. This nightmare is a secret Shadow Garden base deep within the Oriana kingdom. So as funny as it was to see Sid nonchalantly chilling next to 664 and 665, and they didn't know. Neither. And they didn't know. So can you really say that 664 and 665 are dedicated members if they didn't even know their master was right beside? Hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, neither him nor Marie were present here. 
What we miss out from the anime doing this is a series of products exclusive to Mitsugoshi that are seen to adorn this hidden shadow garden base. Aww. First is a secret material used as the foundations for the walls and ceilings, otherwise known to us as reinforced concrete. Just bricks. Next is a transparent crystal okay. glass that serves as an enclosure for the light that radiates within it, and it's multiple of these that are mounted into light Mitsugoshi's high-end chandeliers. Okay. A highly luxurious light fixture in which the cheapest model is 10 million zenny. Jesus Christ. Well, well, back then, like, you know, this, these kind of, like, things didn't exist. So even, like, a light bulb is, like, super luxurious. Both of these are products of Mitsugoshi's engineering and construction, and it's been rumored for some All time Ada. that they do plan on applying these techniques to the construction industry. So that's yet another market that I assume Mitsugoshi are hoping to create a monopoly. They're fucking everywhere, dude. Now, it's as Rose walks through this hallway filled with all sorts of impressive engineering that she contemplates the fact that all of it came from Shadow. No. She couldn't understand not even close. how one so skilled could also be so intelligent too, but the fact remained that both his power and genius appeared limitless. It was a feat she could only wonder as to how it possibly came to be like that. Rose would then meet up with 664 and 665, and it was here that This glasses Rowena was kind of cute. I like it. got a bit of context behind what their numerical titles meant. Their numbers solely represented... Employee ID. Joined Shadow Garden, but... Shadow didn't know. He straight up asked, like, when he said 666 or 559 is going rogue, and they're like, what? Are, are these employee IDs? This, this, he doesn't even know his own structure of his own organization. Well, it makes sense, because doesn't have like a central focus right all, all the other shadow garden girls actually made that shit up but still he didn't know he, he straight up didn't know when it came to actual power it wasn't wrong to consider each set of 100 stronger than the next set of 100 so even if their numbers aren't necessarily their rankings in terms of power you could probably get away using it as a measure for that anyway i think there's three categories right so like obviously if you're number 300 and number 400 is there a big difference no but if you're number 400 and you compare with, let's say, number 24, then yeah, because that's a name number. Because 8 to 25, that's a name number. And then you could go into then compare to number 24 to number 6 and, you know, the seven shades. Yeah, that would matter. There's, there's like tiers, right? There's the seven shades. There's the named numbers. Then the rest, which is from like 25 to 666 or something. That's like the unnamed numbers. So long as you took into account the exceptions, the regimented structure of Shadow Garden was actually... What the fuck? Is this 664? What? <laughs> what is this art? I, 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 what do you mean what's wrong? Have you seen her like that in the anime? 665 makes sense. Right here, we've seen from 665. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You know what I mean. There's the bossy one and there's the blonde one that's always eating something, right? Was she always this stacked? Was she always this stacked? I swear to God, both of these girls were pretty flat, like two tiny girls. But right now, this is insane. Actually quite easy to- I actually love her a lot. She still has no name. I want to know her. I want to know more about her. All she does is, you know, she just like eats. She's always eating. And she has a very easygoing, uh, really chill attitude. I love that about her. Follow. Rose had once been witness to one such exceptions, and it was Victoria's fight against number 89 that made her feel like she too could get strong enough to start changing Ooh, things. Ooh, the promo. She felt that if she became strong like her, then perhaps she could one day save the Oriana Kingdom. When past encounters made it clear that she couldn't change anything, though, all that showed was that she needed to work harder. Effort she was intent on showcasing in this next mission. Look, right now, it's Lollipop too, but there is no bust here that size. For a bit of context on what's been going on in the Oriana Kingdom, it turns out that there's been a fierce conflict between the Perv Faction and the Anti-Perv Faction. Perv? All out war. Pro-Perv and Anti-Perv. War hasn't yet been started, but in small regions at the outskirts of the capital, minor skirmishes have been happening on the daily. Have we actually seen any of the Anti-Perv Faction? Because I don't think we have yet. Because I'm sure they're going to come into, they're going to be important as we move forward and we have to take back the kingdom, but I don't think we have yet. I, I'm sure they're saving it for a reason. I wonder who's part of the anti perfection faction if we actually know, if we have actually seen those characters. This fort was one of such skirmishes, and when the cult had deployed their most elite force to secure hey. it, that was a red flag Wait. which made it clear. <laughs> These that dudes? <laughs> These dudes were so hyped up. Every one of them had like a special name, right? I forget the exact titles, but it's 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 it's, it's like how they gave the titles to who were we fighting before in the previous arc? Getan's men. 
I think some there's like a ninja faction and it's like my name is something of the first blade. I'm the strongest of this group and fucking Gamma just bodied. But these guys also have these type of like Gale Wind, you know, fucking dry wind, cold breeze, heat haze. Yeah, shit like that. <laughs> they all and like the Shadow Garden girls were hyping them up too, right? I think um six is four and six is five. They were all like doing commentary in the slides like, oh my god, is that dry wind? Is that gale wind? Oh my god! And each one of them got by so quick. Most of the force so secured. funny. That was a red flag which made it clear that something was important here. The fort was nothing more than a vacation home the royal family once used to escape the summer heat, but it was before that that they were these historical ruins. A shrine whose purpose was to memorialize all those lost in the battle against Diablos. Now the ruins were filled with corpses, and it was their limp bodies that served as a stark reminder that all this was Rosa's fault. It was her actions Rosa. which started this war, and it was her people that Roses. were suffering because of it. What and that's true. Even the, what's her name? Margaret from last episode. The maid. Remember, there was the, the bigger boy, the chonky boy, the castle guard that was trying to raise up Margaret. Margaret said that she fucking hates Rose. I'm like, why? And she's like, well, she just made this entire kingdom destabilize. Ever since the king was killed, everything has gone to ruins. Our entire life has just gone down. And the more, more I think about it, that's actually very true. <laughs> like, Rose did destabilize this entire kingdom and everyone's quality of life went to shit. It actually makes a lot of sense. What made everything even worse was the fact that she was powerless to do anything to stop it. Her soldiers were dying and her people suffering, yet here she was a Shadow Garden foot soldier, surrounded by people hmm. both stronger and more intelligent. So, if there was any one thing that Shadow Garden had taught her, it was just how small and weak she truly no! was. No! Okay, right here, the curls. The curls get cut even here. You can see that the curl. The, okay, she has the front curls. Someone commented this in the last last episode too, but her curls got immediately longer after those three days of whatever happened between the fight with Victoria. The curls are very short here, and even if you see here, the curls get cut here. But I swear to God, in the last episode, her curls were all back. Like everything was just long hair again. It was as Rose snuck her way closer to the ruins that she could just barely make out a few of the words that Koadoi was saying. Koadoi. They weren't anything too revealing, but they do potentially hint towards what this ring could be. Rose had wanted to know more about it herself, but the reason she couldn't was because those with the rank- This is the same ring that we stole, right? Sid stole this during the piano thing, and that's what Perv asked I had in the box, and he was talking to Mordred saying, if I have this ring, none of it matters, right? We have this ring, right? Like hers weren't allowed to. If there was anything okay. Shadow Garden wanted to keep secure, it was the amount of information that was spread between its members. So, for Rose and the others to be so low down on the totem pole, it was only natural the information they received was on a need-to-know basis. Now, one of the biggest changes to this episode was the way 559 initiated the fight, as well as the way it continued up to the point that Rose was taken- <laughs> Why? Why is the mom's gat on display every time? This is not a coincidence. The author is- no, not the author, but the animator intentionally just like whoring out Oriana's mom. Look at this shit. The point that Rose was taken away from it. If you were just as confused as I was, you'll be happy to know things made a bit more sense in the novels. So, first, 559 didn't initiate by going for Rose's mother, no? but instead engaged with a massive strike intended to wipe out everyone. Oh. Just like how Beta once did in Sanctuary, oh. the blade 559 created had bisected both swords and people alike. Unless you had dodged or were out of range, Nelson. there was absolutely nothing you could do to block this. 559 didn't just stop with that though, because by the time the cult had realized what was happening, she was already onto her next move and methodically killing all the cult members remaining. A grand total of nine were slain before they were finally able to organize themselves. Considering that these were the most elite members of the cult, <laughs> the first it was children. quite impressive how she was able to fell so many. It was when she switched her focus to Rose's mother though that that's when Rose would jump in and stop. Yo, Rose's mom in the manga looks so different. I've seen comparisons that you guys have show me. Discord server? Yeah, go back to the link there. But um, there, there's a fucking... The mom looks so innocent in the manga, but and she looks like an actual damsel in distress, and she's just really just trying to survive. But in the anime, she's just like this villainous queen. Why did they do her like that? Stop her. The vision of her dad had flashed inside her mind, and before she knew it, she was already blocking 559's attack here. Where the anime makes an interesting- The mom's got again! The, 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 why? ...changes the lack of movement by the cult to show that they were taking Rose hostage now. You see, by Rose jumping behind enemy lines to save her mother, the cult was now in position to take advantage of that. They had raised their swords to both Rose and the queen, then threatened to kill them if 559 didn't stop. 
as you would expect from 559 though, she honestly didn't care what they did to them. It was a response that left Koadoi fairly shocked, but not entirely since this is behavior he would have expected from any of the seven. Wow, he's actually acknowledging the power of the seven shades in the manga, but in the in the anime, he's already dead. Shadows. 559 would then reveal that she wasn't one of them, mm. but that just made Koidoi think that she was a Not named yet. Number. When 559. She's not even name number either. I thought she was. I thought she already got the promo, but no, she's working through that promo with Epsilon being the main reference point, the person that would be able to promote you. Revealed that she wasn't one of them either. Koidoi's eyes went wide with shock to the revelation that a number like hers possessed so much power. He could only <laughs> accept that this was the monster he was dealing with and. And like. Think about it. 559 is technically part of, like, it's kind of cheating because she is one of the few people that got direct powers from Shadow, but still, she's part of this, like, lowest tier within this Shadow Garden structure. Unnamed numbers, named numbers, Shadow, and, and then the actual Seven Shades. And even the lowest tier was able to take out the strongest Cult of Diablo members. Well, not the strongest, but the first children were pretty hyped up. They were like elite soldiers still. They were so easy. Do what he could to eliminate her just like all the others. Since neither Rose nor the Queen could be used as leverage anymore though, both were bound and then taken away from the fight. A feat that was only possible since 559 was occupied by the other cultists. They weren't just regular foot soldiers though because in addition to mostly everyone being the highly skilled first children, three of them were also bona fide cult members. Oh? Wait? They were the highest ranking members that made even 664 and 665 quiver. Wait, but they skipped him! that we finally get to Sid, and it's here that we find out Koidoi is actually the lord of the region now. Marie was recounting all the trials she's currently facing, while Sid occasionally nodded his head as if to show he was paying attention to her. <laughs> the Marie and Sid misunderstandings are actually very funny too. The three goons would then walk in shortly after, and Sid would put on his side character act to get them to leave where the anime makes yet another major change. I didn't understand this part. There was a brief flashback of this prison break arc, and I'm like, what the fuck is going on Changes here? Changes the inevitable confrontation in which Sid gets back at them. You see, in the anime, all we got was this comical instant death type ending for them, but in the novel, Sid goes full on eyes on them. Aww. He first greets them in an alley to show that it's him, then instantly disappears the moment they try to attack him. He would then reappear again behind them, except now he's aware that they like to fight by the rules of the lawless city, something he was very much appreciative for. So, another grunt would try a different attack, but once again, Sid would just vanish. It's when he reappears this time, though, that in his hand would be the heart of the person who just attacked him. What? Why did they skip this? This is so much more cold! Just like how Killua once did in Hunter x Hunter, Sid had ripped out Spoilers. his opponent's heart before anyone could even notice it. What? This was obviously enough to make anyone scared, so right as the second- This is actually diabolical. This is just pure terror. I mean, the, the anime made it so just funny. Well, I'm not sure if this is the encounter where Sid was still using Mobfu versus when he showed up at the end and just like killed everybody while that one person was still monologuing. Probably the latter, but still. Damn, he just fucking takes out the guy's heart? And Grunt started to flee. Sid would dash towards him and grasp his heart too. Jesus. Thrusting his hand straight through his chest, then crushing his heart as if it was nothing. Oh my god! The final Grunt could do nothing but plea now, but Sid was committed to finishing this the same way he started. Grasping a third heart before heading off- I am justice? <laughs> what? Is this a new alter ego from Sid? Filled fortress. <laughs> so, I'm not sure why the anime went with the direction that they did instead. Yeah, why? But I think seeing Sid do his own perfected version of Grass Part would have been amazing. Would have been Granted, cool to the see. the scene from the anime was pretty funny too, but I'm sure we all would have enjoyed this one more. I mean, now him like showing up out of nowhere and just killing everybody in silence while that one guy was monologuing, and then he said something really cool to end it. I forget exactly what he said. I think something along the lines of like power is everything and something along the lines of like I've already stolen everything like you're weak. I don't know. Whatever he said there, it was super cool too, but I would love to see the heart stealing techniques. Where the anime brings us yeah. next is the near conclusion of the three day fight with 559. There were over a hundred corpses that now surrounded her. Three of them belonged to the cult leaders who'd previously revealed themselves and the rest were the first children and reinforcements sent afterwards. It was a non-stop fight that left her all bloodied and bruised now. Three her days they fought. Sliced to ribbons, her gut cut open and her left arm completely gone now. Her gut cut open, left arm gone. <laughs> the, the, the manga, no, the light novel, the manga goes into 
The much more like darker details. It was a genuine feat to see her even capable of standing anymore. 664 and 665 no! had been through much of the same were now passed out from- Oh yeah, their arms were actually cut off. I remember in the anime, their arms were actually cut off. Exhaustion and lack of mana. So, it was only 559 and Koidor the Gale now. Koidor Gale would wins. want his victory just like how we saw in the anime, then the healing which would make 559 good as Nia would present her with the opportunity to strike him back. I thought that she was healing herself. My bad. It was just like Shadow still doing it. I, I don't know. It would have been cool if Victoria turned out that she had healing powers too and was able to do like healing as the others, but no, it was Shadow. Unlike the attack which would disintegrate him though. This is straight up the Oriana gift scene. This sequence, many different scenes here, just a direct copy of what Oriana did. Like, if you she don't believe me, go back, go back. Like, it's the same animation. Would instead cut his foot off and do nothing more, leading Koidoi to flee despite only having one foot to run on. As you would expect from a person whose title is Gale, his movements were so quick that you couldn't even see him anymore. Sure, he only had one good foot left, but even with that, the only thing perceptible about him was a gust of wind. He was able to run fast, but unfortunately Ooh. it was straight towards Shadow. Look at him. The moment he had entered into his range, Koidoi was minced into pieces before he could even realize what it was. Did he take his heart again? Look, I think that's his heart. That hit him, bringing an end to the long three-day fight that 559 had started. Now, if you're wondering how it is Sid had even stumbled upon them, well, it was while checking out the ruins in search of treasure that he could sense people using magic in the forest behind him. He was just fucking looting again. He's just looking for random loot. And he's like, oh, there's people fighting around. Let's go check it out. Oh, my girls are dying. Here, let me heal you real quick. The girl who he had spotted exuding it was a person he recognized as Victoria, a possessed girl he had saved almost a year ago. Mm. Back then, One he year was just ago. on a stroll across the country, but it was after spotting her and curing her of the possession that he would bring her back and leave her with Alpha. Are they gonna? She was just a timid girl. I, I know Master of Garden covers the content, like her her backstory. But I, is the anime also gonna cover like where the hell she came from? Who wouldn't even hurt a fly, but now she was this fierce warrior. Timid girl who wouldn't hurt a fly, but now she's a she's a the crazed fanatic. Like what the fuck happened? Her fighting tooth and nail to survive. In fact, it was the clear picture of her struggling to do just that that led Sid to heal her and take care of the old guy bullying her. What makes this situation a whole lot more funny is the circumstances under which Sid assumed all this was happening. You see, when Victoria explained how it was she ended up here, Sid just assumed that she was making up excuses. The whole thing with the cult definitely made sense, but since the cult to him was nothing more than fiction, he was yeah, surprised it's fake that to she him. was able to make up such a coherent story. So like, what does he think everybody's here doing? Like, like he shows up. 664, 665, Victoria, they're all injured, arms are missing, guts are open, and you have a bunch of, like, paid male actors also fighting. So, like, to Sid, when he shows up, this is all, what are we doing, shooting a movie? People will be just fighting in the forest, just using their magic randomly? For the sake of what, entertaining Sid? Not even? What's the point of all this? What is he thinking? See, moments like this, I start to really question... What the fuck is Sid thinking he's doing right now? This is all just a grand act. The girls are just putting on a show for him because they are Shadow Garden members. So wherever he goes, they're just putting on this insane entertainment. This is just a coincidence. I don't know. Does it even matter? I don't really think so. But it really makes you question what the fuck Sid is thinking. Or he's so quickly. To him, he just assumed that she was doing something illegal. Okay. The soldiers then spotted her doing whatever it was she wasn't allowed to, then a fight broke out and led them here. This was the truth that Sid believed was happening. Okay, just random Obviously, fighting. that wasn't the case, but to think Sid acted the way he did while assuming Victoria was fighting random soldiers is pretty funny and kind of terrifying. It's kind of ridiculous. The rest of the episode was pretty much the same, so we can go ahead and skip to the beginning of the next. Starting with Sid's approach towards the royal castle. The anime mentioned he was going to teleport. He's gonna use a, that teleportation, new kind of flash step, and then Epsilon showed up. So I was like, I was pissed for a second, but then again, we saw Epsilon. Gordon, but what he actually meant was that he was going to use one of his advanced movement techniques. What is it? A special ability that lets him move at the speed of sound. Man. I know that's pretty much the same as teleportation, but I for someone see it. like Sid, whose power we know he trains to acquire, super speed makes a bit more sense than instant displacement. At least that's something we know he's actively trained to master. Steps. 
it's after Sid does make it into the castle that the anime for no reason boing, decided boing, to do Epsilon boing. even more dirty. Why? Is oh he, yeah. Like how he <laughs> the 99%, 0%, Epsilon straight up got I'm atomic tier. Yeah, the percentage Sid gave was 99. 99.99%. Oh my god, the anime said 99. Nine. In the novels, the actual number was 90%. I know. What the fuck? I mean, well, that's the only running gag Epsilon has is that ha 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 fake booba ha ha ha. So I, I guess they're gonna have to lean more into it. Well, that's not really an important detail in the slightest, but I felt it necessary since there might actually be a few Epsilon stands out there. The next part only makes. Okay. <laughs> Recently, I have been thinking who is my favorite Shadow Garden girl? And y'all know that I've been putting myself out there for Epsilon, you know, going out to bat for her, you know, justifying her, her struggles and overcoming nature, okay? Right? Because she feels limited in the genetics that she's been given. But through power, through training, she's able to overcome that. She's a fantastic character, okay? And we know that. But fuck goddamn. But Delta has been just... Delta has been getting so many scenes this season. It's not fair. It's, it's actually not fucking fair. It's kind of insane how much... Delta has been rising up in the rankings of the girls I enjoy from Shadow Garden. In season one, she had this one cool scene going against Nelson. She used Bankai, like, great. She was cool. But other than that, there wasn't really much to her. Season two, holy shit. She's gotten so much more development. Even Gamma. Even Gamma fighting the random, you know, the, the, um, the people against that, the corporation people, right? The ninjas that came over. Even Gamma got cool scenes. Everybody is getting a lot of cool scenes. A Ada and Zeta are still not getting any scenes, right? Zeta and Ada both are also kind of just put in the background. But do I really like Epsilon? Is she really my number one girl? At this point, I feel like I'm just saying that because I've been loyal to her since season one. I still do like her. But I think of the anime content we've been given so far, Delta is number one. It's not even fair. And like, if Epsilon also got more dedicated scenes like this, I would probably say something else. So it's not fair. If the anime were to focus more on Epsilon, I'm sure she would shine more. But because the anime went so fucking hard with Delta, like, she, 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 she's pretty much number one right now. She's straight up the closest to Shadow, too, if you think about it. Makes it worse for her, though, since in addition to patting her chest with 90% slime, she also pads her hips and tightens her waist, too. Yeah, ass too, Sometimes I know. Sometimes even going so far as to lengthen her legs. She's actually taller? Oh, what? It's no small feat to pull off any of those things, so to do them all at once and- I haven't switched up. Not yet. I'm just telling you how I feel as an anime only that's been neglected with Epsilon scenes, that's been- and Delta's getting all- Delta's the favorite child right now, and she, she's getting everything, and it's not fair to even compare Epsilon and Delta right now. If Epsilon got more scenes, I'm sure she could compete, but with the amount of Delta focus that's been given this season, really hard for me to say otherwise. To maintain it every day? Well, that's the core reason why she's known for having the most refined sense of magic control out of everyone. That's right, to the point she can also do possession curing. As for Epsilon's identity now, her reputation as Shiron has Shiron. made her known as the greatest pianist in the world. She wasn't known until only a few years ago, but it's after people started hearing her music that she quickly became the talk of concert halls everywhere. Okay. No one could get enough of the way she innovated music with her polished technical skill. So, if Natsume was the rising star for literature, then Shiron was the new up-and-coming celebrity in music. Kind of cool how they both are in the same domain of uh, art, right? Because they kind of also compete. They're, they're, they're like rivals, Beta and Epsilon, in terms of who goes for Shadow. So, it's cool to see that they both are in this art, you know. But, also, what was I going to say? Epsilon, when Perv asked that, asked... Because Epsilon is Miss Shiron, and because she can just kind of enter these high-profile places because of her title, Epsilon said that Sid was a student, but then Perv Asad asked for the name of Sid, but we didn't declare it because it's a name that we're not able to reveal yet. Is that going to play into the next episode? The, the non-revelation -re of the names? I feel like that's an important plot point. Maybe it's pointless. I don't know. They were this powerful duo Boing. who were revolutionizing the world of art right now. Yeah, and this is the first scene, right? Epsilon and Beta meeting. Even This is like Epsilon's introduction. This is how they first started, just the rivals. That being the case, it was only natural the word of Shiron taking an apprentice quickly caused disdain for those who were around to hear it. Yeah. Most, if not all, nobles were speaking of how Sid wasn't worthy to be by her side. 
It wasn't until Sid cleared that tension with immaculate artistry of his own that the room would go silent and pay attention to him now. Obviously, While he was stealing. this was the only song that Sid knew, but to see so Did much- Did you guys notice there's white feathers here? But when Shadow was playing the piano for Oriana in the church, you know, down, downstairs, black feathers. It was black feathers. Am I crazy? I, I swear to God, this is a, a, the parallels. Of if it's like Sid playing, it's like, I don't know, white feathers during the Moonlight Sonata. It was white? Fuck. I swear to God, it was black. Song that Sid knew, but to see so much interest from those so wealthy was quite the intriguing prospective when later hearing how much money he could make. I think there was one single black feather at the very end, wasn't there? Wasn't there? Am I crazy? Am I crazy? The only issue- No, 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 right here. This, this is white feathers right here. This is white, this is white feathers. But at the very end, when the, the song finishes and, and Shadow has walked away from the piano, a single black feather, I swear to God, drops on the piano to end the season. ...was that he'd have to learn different songs. As for the reason he chose this one, well, aside it's from the only being song we the know. only one that he knew, this- <laughs> he, this, this straight up Moonlight Sonata is the only song he knows, right? This was the least notable, least respected out of all of Shiron's pieces. Really? It was the best option to maintain his identity as a side character. The rest of the scene carried out- How the fuck did no one see this? Like, uh, this scene. What? How? How do you not know? How, how do you not see this? Are the are, are, are they invisible? The fuck? Everyone's standing up too. What do you, what do you mean? What do you, whatever, I guess. The same. So if we go ahead and skip to the garden now, there was Margaret. an interesting translation that made the context My of Maggie Sid's Waggy. A different. He never said how Margaret was trying to convert him to her religion, but instead recognized her tactics as the classic one a con man would use. As a fellow con man himself, he knew giving up a secret was a classic move many used to gain someone's trust fast. If you ever wanted someone to think you were their friend, it was best to feign vulnerability just like how Margaret did than okay. reveal something valuable as if to show that you yourself trust them. This was the behavior Sid was avoiding here. The next part with Kevin <laughs> actually had him in- Okay, so this guy's name is Kevin. He's the greatest side character in this show that's ever existed. This straight up is- a fucking legend, okay? Of all the side characters running gag so far, like we've had pretty like Quinton was pretty good. Goldie, I think Goldie's still pretty fucking good. This dude Kevin is built different. Straight up look at him. He just shows up, gut hanging out. He's his belly is out. He's wearing this shirt as two sizes too small for him. You don't you think Kevin gives a fuck? Kevin does not give a fuck, bro. He's like a complete giga chat, stealing the hearts of his girls like Maggie Waggy, and dude. Margaret make conversation. Oh so good. Aside from her directly stating that she hated his guts. There wasn't much. So in the manga, this is him. Much else to point out. In the manga, Kevin is a fucking wimp, dude. In the manga, Kevin's a scrawny ass little bitch, bro. In the anime, he's a fucking giga chat. What the fuck? He's trying to show his eight pack, bro. That's not a eight pack. This is a whole ass fucking keg he got stored here. But yeah, I guess in the manga he's a different. Huh? He's a nerd in the manga, but in the anime he's a fucking giga chat. Point out here. <laughs> Straight up. Hentai protagonist Kevin, dude. If anything, her stating she despises him. Straight up the precursor to fat, ugly bastard and anti bro. Straight up. This is the guy that steals every girl. This dude, he'll steal every girl from all the fucking, you know, pretty boy fucking uh, characters and hentai. No, look at him. This guy right here. That's him. He's him. I love him. Stating she despises him just makes his ignorance that much more comedic. The reason the only thing Sid did was apologize was because when it comes to dealing with people like this, she and I are bound by our inseparable love. Our eyes always meet at the flower garden to reassure each other of our feelings. Wait, so the best strategy. She always seems a bit was what? To just ignore them and apologize over and over again. She always seems a bit embarrassed as she tries to like run away from me. Probably he's probably thinking the eye contact. So they probably you know. Margaret's probably chilling in the garden doing her job. Kevin shows up. They make eye contact. Margaret's thinking, oh, fuck, it's him again. And she fucking just like awkwardly walks away. And Kevin thinks that, ah, she loves me. I am him. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> but here you are trying to interfere with our true love. I, a participant in the God of War Festival. Wow. <laughs> participant in the God of War Festival. Yeah. In the end, they would always storm off thinking Dude, that they'd achieve something. This is so good. The way, look at the confidence Kevin has as he walks away, dude. Off thinking that they'd achieve <laughs> look at him. 
<laughs> this is actually one of my favorite running gags in Emerson's Shadow. It's gonna be pretty hard for something to surpass this fucking side character, Kevin. He shows up, delivers, leaves. What a giga chat. I was initially shitting on him because I didn't understand what kind of character he'd be. Goddamn, I love Kevin so much. Achieve something. It's when we get to the next scene with Rose that, yet again- How the fuck did her hair grow back? Like, look. I told you guys. It's when we get to the next scene with-, with Well, the back- No, technically- Technically, I think she was hiding the back hair, the back- Back hair the entire time. Like, you can still see that the front curls, right? They are shorter. But even, even in the beginning scene, right? Even in the beginning scene, when Oriana was in bed, was the hair this long? I don't think so. Was it? I swear to God. So I, did, didn't her hair actually get longer? Like, am I crazy? Am I fucking crazy? Or did her hair actually get longer? I'm pretty sure it did. I Rose, that yet again were confronted by the core essence of eminence and shadow. Misunderstandings that eventually lead to something bigger. The first comes from Rose and how she perceived Sid's rival. Okay, in the manga, it's never been cut. Straight up, it's just always been this long. Because for a peasant like him to make it all the way to her, well, that was an accomplishment which would have required a miracle. Not only did he just have to infiltrate a castle, but to cross international borders and even become the apprentice of Shiron, those were things that should have been impossible to him. So much so that Rose couldn't even begin to fathom the amount of work necessary to even get noticed by Shiron. This is pretty funny. This is pretty funny where she's just crying taking pictures. To then do all that just for her? See, okay. <laughs> Did you see that? Did you see that? <laughs> the biscuit was in his hand while he fucking caressed Oriana's face, reassuring her that everything's gonna be fine. Just for her? Well, <laughs> still right there. <laughs> still right there. It's enough to make her heart beat straight out of her chest. Doki Doki. It was an undeniable sign that she could only perceive as true love. Isn't this true love? Do you think that this is the main ship? Do you think? Does it actually care about Oriana? Does she? Does he? Is there love here? What's going on? What is what is Sid thinking when he's talking to Rose like Does because he was pretty against the marriage. He was pissed off that she would go back to Pervasa for the marriage, but he didn't understand everything. Not yet, anyways. Now he does, right? Romantically, he doesn't care, not yet. I thought that maybe. Then again, he he literally simped for nobody. But I thought that maybe there was a chance. And when she retakes the kingdom, who's going to be the king? Does there need to be king? Can't Rose just rule the kingdom by herself? I don't know what's going to happen to this kingdom after we, like, save it. But I would assume that someone's going to have to lead it again. So I'm like, huh, if Rose becomes the queen, would Sid become the king? Would that even make sense? I have no clue. Now, the cookies Sid was eating weren't yeah. actually here, but it the was very on great. brand to include them. Reason being that to allow Eminence and Shadow to get too serious is to make Sid seem like he actually cares about all this. True. We don't want to misplace Sid's concern towards Rose or her mother, so what better way That's to- That's right, we don't want to- the show doesn't want to, you know, make Sid be too empathetic, right? We gotta make this guy into a fucking psychopath, he's gotta be misunderstanding, not understanding a single thing, right? We can't have him have these moments where he truly understands what's going on. So he's only in it for himself, then to have him stuffing his face all while Rose cries her heart out. That's pretty funny. We then get to the misunderstanding about both their dreams, which for Rose is the one where she thinks that they could be married, then for mm. Sid it's all about being the eminence in shadow. Neither are on the same page when talking about it, but somehow their back and forths all seem to relate to it. So maybe, maybe there's a chance. Maybe there's a chance. It's that recurring dynamic that just keeps going and going. It's when Perv walks in after that it turns out Sid was in the room with them. He was somehow hidden right there in plain sight, sipping tea and eating cookies all while this encounter was That's right, happening. he took the plate out. He took Both the plate were out. extremely delicious, so to Sid it now made sense where all the Oriana Kingdom's tax money was going. <laughs> he also felt that by partaking in these luxuries himself, he was therefore depriving the nobles of having it, which in turn avenged the common folk for their misspent tax. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we, are, we are technically fucking taking back against the kingdom by eating all these biscuits. Okay, the spoilers are about to show up. Are these actually important spoilers? I'll watch just a bit, okay? I'll be very careful. Spoilers in four seconds. It was certainly okay. quite the bit of mental gymnastics, but the end result did actually get kept. The end result did actually get kept. You know what? You know what? Because Kevin is involved, we're gonna skip it. Okay, I trust you. Yeah, and actually, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna skip it. We're gonna skip it. We're gonna skip it. All right. From the past two episodes, 
I hope you enjoyed what you saw. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, you know what? The fact that I heard Kevin's name there gets me very hyped. Wasn't really a spoiler, but I was very careful about it. Another dub video by Annie News, as usual, giving us more context about the Emerson Shadow. Please like his video, subscribe to his content. I wish that he talked a little bit more about Black Rose, because the Black Rose seems to be some kind of I'm atomic level weapon, at least from what it was shown in the anime of the map region becoming a gaping hole. So there's going to be some crazy moment about the Black Rose. Maybe Annie decided to kind of not cover the topic because it'd be a little bit too spoilerish to go into detail about what it could be. But next episode, I'm sure there'll be it. I am hyped for this arc to end. And goddamn, you know there's going to be a moment where Rose might say something like, I am Black Rose, or at least that's what my YouTube video's title is going to be.